Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I hope very much you will give me a hearing because I've come from such a long way away. <laughs> a world without walls. I am grateful to the organizers of this conference for the opportunity to present at this year's 25, 25th anniversary celebrations. For me, there is meaning and nuance in my being in Berlin again this year, 2014. This year marks 100 years since the end of 14 years of German colonial rule in Samoa, 1900 to 1914. At the start of this year, I had the honor of opening the State Museum for Ethnology in Munich, which houses a shared history between our countries. Some of this history, many of us would prefer perhaps not to remember. Even so, given the focus of our celebrations, I seek your indulgence for what I'm about to say. For a world without walls requires a world willing to see them when they exist, to name them, and to bring them down if need be. Federal President Joachim Gauck stated in his luncheon address at Schloss Bellevue in January this year that the State Museum for Ethnology holds records of the fate of Samoans who were brought to Germany to take part in Volkerschauen ethnological expositions on the eve of the First World War. Publicly admitting to historical existence of these exhibitions is an important step forward in gaining understanding, forgiveness, and or healing. The museum's records of these ethnological exhibitions, like photographic or other records of the Berlin Wall, serve as reminders to humanity of the heavy price we pay for our human weaknesses and curiosities. In this sense, mementos such as the Berlin Wall serve, as Bill Gorovich and Rachel Buchanan point out, not so much to define history, but to act as invitations to look more closely into history and to ask questions of it. In preparing for this talk, I came across two, a 2007 article in the uh, History Today magazine by Frederick Taylor on the Berlin Wall. In the article, there is a picture of people standing and sitting along the part of the wall formerly known as Checkpoint Charlie, where the infamous altercation between the Americans and last and East Germans took place. The caption at the bottom of the picture reads, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1989. The photo shows a part of public photo documentation wall at former Checkpoint Charlie. Berlin. There are people in this particular photo standing with banners. One reads, love and peace in East and West. I reproduced a photograph for reference. The message of the photograph seems to be that Berlin Wall, like all walls, are monuments to a moment in time, and in this case, to divide a nation. Literally bringing down the wall was always going to be seen as an act that would symbolize a reunified Germany. And as Taylor suggests, it was a reunification that came about because of internal rather than external pressure. The Berlin Wall, both its construction and length of time it stood and was policed, symbolized, according to Taylor, not only the suppression of human rights, but also a cruel negation of post-war German rights to self-determination. The latter is a reference to the international community's post-war maneuverings, especially those maneuverings employed by Western democracies who saw a reunified Germany more as an eco-political threat than anything else, and so did little to assist in bringing the wall down. A world without walls seems, therefore, to demand a right to self-determination. It seems to assume for individuals, groups, and nations the freedom and capacity to determine for themselves in responsible ways where they want to go, when, how, with whom, and for what purpose. 
The right to self-determination is considered a core principle of international law and is protected by the United Nations Charter and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But such rights of freedoms and the instruments or conventions that protect them are not worth anything if people do not recognize and give effect to them. Furthermore, such rights and freedoms do not exist in a vacuum. They exist alongside duties and responsibilities. Given this, what would it mean to live in a world without wars? And are wars really something we can live without? In Samoan, the word used to describe the idea of protection or protecting is pui pui. The word pui pui was recorded by Reverend George Pratt in the late 19th century and referring also to a door or partition as in the old saying, olona pui pui. Pratt notes that the word pui pui could as a verb also mean to shut, to shut off, to shut up. In modern Samoan usage, the word for prison is fale pui pui, meaning a house of fale that keeps people, namely criminal offenders, in and shuts them off from society, therefore protecting pui pui society from them. The addition of the prefix fale to fale pui pui seems necessary here in order for the modern Samoan mind to conjure the correct image of protection of who is being protected from whom and how. When people are placed within prison walls, there is always lurking the fear of oppression. Perhaps these kinds of walls is what, what we could live without. But walls are not in themselves oppressive as the Samoan translation of the word pui pui suggests, walls are in the first instance for protection. The Samoan word pa pui pui, which refers specifically to a defense wall, makes this point. It is only when walls are used unreasonably to inhibit a person's or a group or a nation's human rights and freedoms that they become oppressive. The double meaning implicit in the notion of a wall or pui pui underlines and nuances the slippages, dilemmas, and paradoxes of the seductive phrase, a world without walls. Because walls are both harmful and protective, much will depend not on the question of whether to have walls, but where and when. To make a point about understanding cultural context, I want to retell here the well-known story about Tapuitea, a Samoan legend about a cannibal woman who wanted to eat her siblings and then repented and became the morning and evening star. The story goes that one day Tapuitea decided she wanted to feed on her kin. Realizing this, her brother jumped into the sea to try to escape her. He swam to a place in Samoa called Falealupo. Tapuitea followed. The brother arrived first and went to look for a hiding place. He devised a plan to trick his sister into believing he had come ashore, then returned to sea. He decided he would walk backwards from the sea to the shore to give the impression that he was walking towards the sea. He managed to walk far enough towards backwards to reach a freshwater bathing pool that had pandanus tree hanging over it. The brother climbed the tree and hid there. When Tapuite arrived to where her brother came ashore, she followed the footsteps and at first thought he had gone back to sea. After tasting the salt water still in his footprints, Tapuitea realized that her brother was still ashore and went searching for him. She chased him, but he managed to get back to the protection of his parents. When Tapuitea came into his parents' presence, they rebuked her severely for wanting to cause such grave harm to her own flesh and blood. She became very remorseful, and in her remorse, she decided to earn her can to end her cannibalism and make amends. She declared to her family, from this day I renounce cannibalism. I shall ascend to the heavens and appear at the morning and evening star, where I shall be the guide for your fishing and sailing expeditions. The message of this story is that even when we do each other great wrong, 
there is always room for forgiveness if there is true remorse. The story makes the point that while boundaries considered sacred, tapu, or ethical may be crossed and punishments imposed, real justice and healing can only come through the presence of true forgiveness and remorse. If there are walls between remorse and forgiveness, then the ability to achieve real justice and healing is blocked. Finding true remorse and forgiveness is the cornerstone of some more notions of justice, implicit in the ritual of the former. Walls that act to block the achievement of true remorse and forgiveness are walls that ought to be brought down. The story of Tapuitea also emphasizes a core belief among ancient Samoans that humans share a genealogy and destiny, not only with each other, but with nature and the cosmos. Our worlds and destinies are inextricably linked to those of our planet. Knowing when to bring down the walls that block our ability to feel true remorse or forgiveness for what we have done to our planet means regaining that earthbound humility that Cardinal Maradiaga described so eloquently. Such humility, he argues, will help us to do everything within our reach to humanize nature and for nature in turn to humanize us. We can read Maradiaga's wisdom in the story of Tapuitea. In becoming the morning and evening star, nature was able to humanize to show her the value of service and humility. Through her faithful service as morning and evening star, Tapuitea was in turn able to humanize nature. One of the great walls that imposes on the current global equation is the assumption that there is a universal truth that usurps all truths, that ultimately there is only one justice, one law for all, one way of knowing, one way of being. Revealing the arrogance of this assumption is the heart of a call for cultural democracy. Like the wars we have been discussing, cultural diversity is both a strength and a weakness. Being able to listen to the story of Tapuitea from beginning to end without squirming, and to be able to draw out the general messages or principles and still appreciate the cultural idioms it holds requires an openness to cultural diversity. Being open to learning new languages is key to appreciating cultural diversity. Being able to hear about past injustices without judging or wanting revenge is also an important part of knowing cultural diversity. All of these aspects of cultural diversity are prioritized within cultural democracy. But a culturally democratic world is not necessarily a world without walls. For me, a culturally democratic world is a world that redeems a lost humility. It is a world that shares in commitment to a global ethic that can protect Puipui ourselves and our homes from harm, and that can openly strengthen those freedoms and responsibilities that allow for human diversity to flower naturally in ways that naturalize and humanize us without oppressive constraint. It is a world that sees the irony, humor, and reality of an often told scene that happened at the Berlin Wall when it came down. Here, the West Germans, who were standing at the side of the world, filled with emotion and engaged in solemn prayers, were upon the fall immediately perplexed when confronted by rushing crowds from the East who wanted to know where can I find a departmental store? And finally, it is a world that can appreciate the wisdom of one of my favorite sayings uttered by one of my favorite American actresses, Meryl Streep, when she played the Iron Lady, the late Margaret Thatcher, when Margaret recites the saying passed on to her by her father. Watch your thoughts will they become words. Watch your words will they become actions. Watch your actions will they become habits. Watch your habits will they become your character. And watch your character because it be becomes your destiny. What we think we become. So what does it mean to celebrate 25 years since the coming down of the Berlin Wall? 
For me, it means two things. First, it means celebrating triumph over oppression. For it, always, for it is always good to be reminded that human goodness can indeed triumph over despair and humiliation. And secondly, it means celebrating the joys of knowing that we have watched our thoughts, we have watched our words, we have watched our actions, our habits, and our character, and we can go to sleep knowing that our destinies have become much better for it. So if we're happy celebrations, God bless.